So now that we've talked about sort of how the fork join pool works from a divide and conquer point of view, we talked just a little tiny bit about how we have fork join tasks that can be submitted and they're put into this shared queue that are pulled off by these worker thread worker threads. We're going to talk a bit more in detail about how things work internally. And the reason for covering this now <coughs> is that when we get into the actual examples later, it'll make a lot more sense what's going on if you understand how it works under the hood. It's also just really cool to know how the fork join pool works internally because it's very powerful. So as I mentioned before, each worker thread, remember a worker thread is just a good old Java thread. Each worker thread in a fork join pool runs a loop that scans for subtasks to execute. And the idea is we'd like the worker threads just to keep looping forever doing work. So that's the goal, keep them all running all the time. So keeping the worker threads as busy as possible is the, the real intent of the design of the fork join pool. And in fact, a worker thread only blocks waiting for more work if there is absolutely nothing else left to do. If everything else is uh, finished, then and only then will the worker threads put themselves to sleep. And the reason for this is because it's expensive to block and later unblock or suspend and resume a worker thread on a modern processor. Modern multi-core processors really don't like putting the cores to sleep. They like to have them running. And so as a result, it's expensive to put them to sleep and restart them. So the goal is to keep everything running as, as uh, much as possible. Therefore, each worker thread will check multiple different sources of input to try to find work to execute. And that's the key thing to remember when you're thinking about the fork join pool is the fact that people are really obsessive compulsive about finding work to do. Here's how this works. Under the hood, each worker thread in a fork join pool is managing its own separate work queue, which is called a DEC, which is short for double-ended queue. So a DEC is a double-ended queue, and it's called work queue. And this is the main source of input for the worker thread to process. Internally, if you poke around in the source code, if you click on this link, you'll find the source code for this class. It's really quite fascinating to read it. Um, you'll see that there's a nested class called a work queue, and it's got a whole bunch of methods on it. Some of the most important methods, which we'll talk about briefly later, are push, pop, and pull. And you'll see what those things do. If a task that's running in a worker thread happens to call fork, and I should say task or subtask. If it's a task or subtask and it calls fork, the new task that's been forked is pushed onto the head of that worker thread's work queue or its DEC. Remember, DEC is a double-ended queue. You'll see why it's double-ended in a second. So we, if, if a task says fork, that ends up pushing that subtask onto the work queue. Now, the way this works is that a worker thread processes the elements on its deck in last in, first out order, which is, as you probably remember from your data structures class, that's the way a stack typically works. You push things onto the top and you pop things off the top. So that's last in, first out, or LIFO order. Lots of metaphors for this. I'm sure you've heard them a million times. A stack of trays in a cafeteria is a good example of a LIFO stack, because you put something on the top, and then you take the top item off the top. When there's work to be processed, the worker thread pops the task or subtask from the head of its deck, and then it runs that subtask to completion. And that just means that it just keeps executing whatever that subtask is until that subtask is finished. Why does it work this way? Well, the reason it works this way is for optimization. The idea is as follows. If we push and pop things off the top of the deck or the top of the stack, then it's likely that whatever was pushed most recently will still have all of its cache warm, its instructions, its data are likely to be warm. It's called locality of reference. You try to work with the things that are most 
close to where you are because they probably have all their resources available and therefore will improve performance because we'll have better locality of reference and better cache behavior. So caches tend to work best if they have locality of reference. It's a good concept. You probably have heard about that hopefully in a operating system class if you've taken the operating system class. So locality of reference for cache management is important. That's why worker threads like to work off the top of their deck. If a task run by a worker thread calls join, then that worker thread pitches in to pop and execute subtasks. And that's kind of the Jiffy Lube model we were talking about before. So if we're going to um, join, then this thread will do a bunch of other stuff um, until we finally get its subtask completed, at which point it can then continue doing whatever it needs to do after the join returns. So that's the collaborative model of processing. Uh, each thread does not, uh, each thread could have multiple subtasks to complete. They just get stored up in the work queue. So you can see here, if you, if you do, you know, push, 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 then as you pop stuff off, there'll be a bunch of things on your, on your deck to work on. Why do we not have multiple threads where each thread has one subtask? Well, you'll see in a second why. And it has to do again with locality of reference. Um, and it, really has to do with, oh, well, you'll see in a second when we talk about how this is implemented under the hood, the way in which the, because the deck is only pushed and popped from a single thread, then you can have extremely lightweight locking for that. And so that's the primary reason. And I'll, I'll show you that in a second. So remember we keep talking about maximizing core utilization? To, to really maximize core utilization, idle threads, like if this particular thread has nothing else to do, it's going to steal work from other threads' decks. So if you have, remember there's a bunch of threads, there's one thread for every core, at least one thread for every core, probably more, but at least there's one thread for every core on the, that the virtual machine knows about. And so if a subtask doesn't have anything to do in its deck or its work queue because it's finished, it then goes and looks for somebody else's work queue that has work, and it steals work from the tail of the queue. And it's very important, we'll talk about why it steals from the tail in a second. But that's what work stealing is all about. And the way in which the work queue is selected to try to steal from is done randomly. And the idea behind randomly selecting a work queue is to try to lower contention. If you always went and tried to steal from the same work queue, then you'd have all the threads trying to steal from the same queue and you'd have contention, which would slow down the processing. <clears throat> so instead of that, what it does is it randomly, you know, if, if there's eight queues, it says, oh, I'll pick six this time, I'll pick two that time, I'll pick seven this time, I'll pick three, right? You just sort of randomly try to pick them in different orders. The tasks are always stolen in FIFO order. So what is FIFO? FIFO is first in, first out. That's what you typically think of as a queue. So our work queue is a deck, so you can push and pop things from the head, and then you can take things off of the tail or the end. So they're stolen in FIFO order. And the reason for doing this, this perhaps gets to the question we just talked about a second ago. The reason for getting things at the end, not the beginning, is we're trying to minimize contention with the thread that owns the deck. So remember, every work thread, every worker thread is going to have its own deck. And for the most part, that, that worker thread pushes and pops items onto the deck at the front, at the head. But if another thread comes along and wants to steal something, it tries to steal from the end. Why is that? That's because there won't often be any contention between things at the front, which are pushing and popping to the front, and stuff at the end. And as long as there's more than one item in the queue, then they won't contend for the same lock. That's a, an optimization. Another reason they do it this way is that older tasks, remember 
the way that things worked was that the as the uh, original thread put stuff onto its work queue, it puts them on in LIFO order, last in first out, which means that the oldest elements are at the end and the newest elements are at the front. And because of the way we typically do splitting in um, fork join pool processing, where you start with the whole thing, you split it in half, you push those items onto the front, then some other threads take those half items, they split them again into quarter items, they put those things in the front. So the things that tend to be at the tail of the queue tend to be the bigger things. And so if we steal from the end, we're likely to get larger chunks to further subdivide. So if we steal a bunch of bigger stuff, then we can further split them up into smaller parts on our work queue. So that's another reason why we steal from the end. One reason is to avoid contention with anybody who's or with the owning thread that's working on the front. And the other reason is to be able to further decompose stuff um, that's working at the end. The work queue itself is implemented in a very clever way. It uses something called a work stealing deck. You can read a paper that explains what a work stealing deck here at this link is. And I'll go through kind of how it works. Once again, the whole purpose of this is to minimize lock contention. So push and pop, these calls, are only done by the owning worker thread. So here's an example. Here's the owning thread. And so pushing and popping is only ever done by the owning thread. And as a result, they can use very efficient hardware-based compare and swap operations. You can read more about compare and swap here. But basically, these are often what are known as wait free operations because they never wait. They just spin. And because the contention is exceedingly low, because there's only typically one thread reading and writing from the deck at the front, then they use these compare and swap operations. So as a consequence, they're really, really, really fast and they never wait. Um, and the only time you'd ever have any contention would be if there was only one element in the queue and someone else was trying to get it off the tail. Pull, on the other hand, can be called from another worker thread to steal a subtask. So remember, we push and pop from our thread for the owner, but we steal from some other thread at the end of that thread's deck. And pull is the operation that's used to do this. And pull tries to be weight free, but there are times when it just has to block because you eventually run out of stuff that you can do. So you have to wait for something to do. And you can read about, you can read this paper by Doug Lee, who's the guy who wrote Fork Join Framework, who explains how this all works. Um, if you're also really curious, you can take a look at the implementation overview comments in the source code for the Fork Join pool. And uh, it's really, really interesting. I don't guarantee that it's something you'll understand at first reading, but it's very, very deep and uh, obviously took a lot of thinking to get that to work. Yes? So if it only had one thing in its queue, um, conceivably it could steal it. it. It just would have to make sure that it would lock the access to the queue in such a way that if the thread that owned that queue or that deck, as a better word is deck, if the thread here, let's say that the thread in the middle is trying to steal from the end of the queue from the thread at the top. And let's say for sake of argument, there's one item there. And let's say that this thread's off processing some other task at the moment. So at this point, this second thread comes along, grabs the lock on this queue, goes ahead and you know steals it. That's fine. Um, it just has to make sure it's locked properly so that if this thread happens to finish, whatever it's doing while this guy's trying to steal it, that they don't end up with some corrupted intermediate state. But yeah, that's a good question. Okay, any other questions about that? Okay, so that's the end of part three of this lesson.